There we go. Right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon or this evening, wherever you're dialing in from. Uh, I'm Rebecca Saunders-Jones. I'm the Head of Operations at Future U, and I'll be the host for today. Uh, I'm joined by Alex Hepworth, um, who let you all in today, our marketing team, and also Sahel Merza, who will uh, lead this webinar today. So in case you're not familiar with Future U, um, Future U is an online platform offering 100% free CPD accredited courses uh, for health and social care professionals. We have a library on our app and via our website of over 100 courses uh, right now, and that is growing uh, all the time, covering everything from sort of medical conditions to brain injury, dementia, epilepsy, seizure management, uh, basic life support, etc. Um, so there's loads on there for, for everyone to have a look at. Today, though, is going to be our, one of our uh, three wellness webinars uh, that we'll be hosting for you over the next month uh, to really help you master your emotions and become the best version of yourselves. The session today will take us... has a broad face too. Yeah. Oh, just pop yourself on mute. That'll be wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Um, so... Um, yeah, the sessions will last an hour and they kind of build on one each other, one another. So do sort of watch them in turn. Um, and we recommend signing up to all of them, of course, if you haven't seen them. Uh, they will be recorded. So we'll send this link out to you afterwards um, that you can rewatch or for anyone who's missed it, they can um, catch up on it. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sahel Merza, who's going to lead this webinar today. He is a recognized um, inner wellness coach and um, has over 20 years experience in healthcare. He is our executive director at Future U and a non-exec director at uh, New Cross Healthcare and an author of many books. Um, well, author of the book called Many Mansions, apologies, um, which charts his personal journey of um, kind of inner wellness and personal growth. Um, he is also a specialist advisor to uh, the healthcare sector, among others, he supported the wellness of the frontline NHS and social care workforce during and since the pandemic. Um, and he's also the host of a podcast called Voices of Care that you can access and we'll send you links afterwards as well. So um, without further ado, I will hand over to Sahail, who will lead us through this um, hour long webinar. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for the introduction. Welcome, everybody, uh, far and wide uh, in the UK and beyond. Um, as Rebecca said, this is part of a series of three webinars. Um, and the goal, just to put the expectations up, uh, there's no magic formula that suddenly is going to solve everybody's life. So if that's what you look for, suddenly you could all leave and say, oh, what's he talking about? The key for me is our, the quality of our life is our emotions, what we're feeling right now, what's going on in our mind right now. So the goal of all three webinars over a period of time is to give you more of the emotions that you want, which are empowering, less of the emotions that you don't want, and if, like me, you have a voice in your head that can be the source of super criticality, we're going to quieten that down tremendously. If we click to the next slide, please, Rebecca, um, I'm very proud uh, to be involved in healthcare. I've been in healthcare for 20 years, had a family business actually providing care for the elderly in their own homes, uh, which we sold um, about 10 years ago. Uh, the podcast series uh, has allowed me over the last year or so to meet with over 50 of the leaders in the NHS and social care. And without any surprise, wellness has proved to be a hugely important topic. I think we, there's a report literally that came out today, 18 million working days lost per annum in, in the UK because of poor well-being. So it's a priority issue uh, for everybody. And the key thing is, I think we have to be open and honest about these things and hopefully give some simple but not easy tips in terms of if we go to the next slide and just what we're going to go through, we're going to look at what I mean by inner wellness. I think that's going to be quite important. And we're going to look at some key principles, see what's happened in recent years, and hopefully give you some steps. And this is the big promise that requires 15 minutes a day, a few minutes a day, and over time can make that dramatic difference. Now, I have come from a variety of backgrounds that Rebecca has um, been very kind to share. And what brings me to talk about wellness? Um, for me, uh, wellness was a very personal thing that happened about 10 years ago. And I think the important thing is sometimes we're faced with things in life that we cannot solve. I was always a positive thinker. 
always believed that you could find a way to solve things. But sometimes you're dealt things that actually you can't solve. And about 10 years ago, um, my wife uh, told me, we, I'd inherited three stepdaughters who were in their teens, and my wife and I then had our own daughter who was two at the time. And I realized there was something wrong, there was just something missing which was causing me a problem. And to her credit, in many ways, um, my wife was courageous enough to say that she regretted having our daughter. Now, that has a huge impact because that's not something you can positively walk yourself away from. And that had a huge impact on my well-being and it actually shattered my world a lot. And I thought, okay, I can't think my way out of this. I can't just pump myself up. Is there somewhere else where I can find something that's perhaps eternal, that's something I can connect to, whatever the vicissitudes of life? And that really led me onto the journeys around the world. I met a lot of teachers to try to find something that could actually keep me going in the most difficult circumstances. And what I did was I put those things together to deal with that situation. We tried our very best because that has a huge impact um, on a marriage. And two years later, um, unfortunately, for a number of reasons, um, primarily because the promises upon which a marriage is, are based had been broken. And I realized, therefore, I had to put um, the marriage to an end. Uh, my daughter was still there. We were still struggling. Um, and then a week later, um, my wife had a stroke in front of my eyes. And life gives us that moment between stimulus and response. What are we going to do? Are we going to think about ourselves? Are there bigger principles involved? So I decided for the bigger picture to stay, support her recovery. And during that period of recovery, I actually did something I promised myself I'd never do. So I used to hate social media. And then I went on to face, Facebook because that was what allowed me time to actually deal with the nurturing of my wife and to deal with all the repercussions that were going to follow. And I shared some of the principles that had helped me over the years navigate this very difficult set of circumstances with different priorities. And people were very kind enough uh, to ask me to share those principles. And that's what I ended up doing. Now, what it helped me to do was to have a set of principles that could help every single day on a daily basis. It didn't have to be lofty and difficult. Could I deal with things on a daily basis? I shared that with people, wrote the book that Rebecca's talking about, um, uh, and that did really well. And that's what brought me to the NHS a few years ago. I was very well connected to a few leaders who said, can you come along and support, particularly during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, with some simple steps that people can cope with. So that's what I'll be sharing with you today. And as we go into this, there's two promises I want to make right at the, right at the beginning. One, everything that I'm sharing is experiential. It's based not on theory, there's a lot of theory behind it, it's, either, it's stuff that I've done that's helped me or helped the people that I've coached. So it's, it's based on reality. And secondly, um, from a former lawyer, don't hold that against me, that uh, qualification. Uh, the second promise I want to make is that I will tell you the truth. Some of the things will not be easy to do. They're all simple, but that's not a synonym for easy. Some of the stuff will demand quite a lot of people. And I will say that when that comes out. Um, Rebecca, if we can go to the next uh, slide. I wanted to begin just to take a bit of a temperature check very briefly. Uh, these are words that have come from nurses and care workers over the last few months. I've delivered the webinars uh, to organizations with over 100,000 employees combined and, pe and asked people, what are the two or three words that perhaps summarize how you best feel, how you feel right now that summarizes it? And I think some of these words will be quite uh, familiar. I'll be intrigued to see, um, by all means, write in the chat. Are there one, two or three words that would perhaps summarize how you've been feeling? For me, I think I would say that I am optimistic, but I definitely feel a sense of overwhelm. I think there seems to be so much going on, and that can sometimes be really quite challenging, but I do feel uh, at ease in the sense that I know where I'm going. So those are the three emotions for me. I don't know, Alex, if, if there's any that really strike home uh, to, to you um, that would be really interesting. Um, just before we do that, Gail has talked about emotional, anxious, and optimistic, so that balance uh, that we've talked about. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Alex, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, I, I think I uh, I would agree with Gail, actually. I think it's always funny at the start of the new year, it feels like a, there's a kind of a fresh break, a fresh start, which is great. So there's an element of feeling optimistic, but then at the same time, that can feel quite overwhelming because it's sort of, you don't want to, I know I'm, I'm one of those people that still makes resolutions and then I break my resolution after a few days. And so I immediately think, oh, you know i've messed it up so there's a, that kind of feeling optimistic but also feeling a little bit overwhelmed about 
about that kind of fresh start and making sure I set myself up in the best possible way. I think, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, seems no, to and, but, and we've seen some similar, similar uh, reactions and Rich here is talking about happy, emotional, which is a very wide term, optimistic. Belinda, concerned and optimistic. Uh, Becky here saying optimistic with some elements, at ease with others. Overwhelm seems to be coming up quite a lot. Um, Caroline's talking about, and that's not surprising when you think just in the macro picture that's going on around the world in the UK. I think we've got on Monday the 15th, my memory's right, what they've now anointed as Blue Monday, as the, as the unhappiest day, because we've got that new year you talked about, Alex. So th thank you, Peter. Happy, emotional, optimistic, that's, that's great. So um, um, I think it's, forgive my pronunciation, I think Medline, I believe it's, uh, I'm in between content and overwhelmed, weird. Absolutely. If emotions are lovely and sequential, life would be so simple. But I think it's we're getting that mix. So thank you for sharing that. Now, the similar thing that I do with all the NHS and social care people that I've uh, delivered webinars for. If we go to the next slide, please, um, Rebecca. Uh, Giovanna's talked here. Uh, emotional, everyone. Thank you, Giovanna. Where would you like to be? What's most important to you as uh, an individual? Whether it's Yawanda, whether it's Demelza, uh, Giovanna. Where would you like to be? Is it normally it's a mixture of all of these things for me love is very very important and the idea of a connection and peace but what would place of peace for becky alex i mean you don't have to choose one you can have all of them i just all of the above caroline there you go perfectly bang on time absolutely uh, and to place of peace i think uh, that's coming out stronger or something for me alex uh yeah i'm going to cheat and say all of them to be honest <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. And Gail has also said a place of sin. Um, Medline, a place of love and meaning. Peace for Belinda. Strength, Rebecca, mental strength. Thank you for that. Connection from Precious. Positive good feelings for this year, having just returned from Thailand. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. We've got some international travelers here. Demelza back from the, with a big smile. Thank you for that. Um, Peter out in uh, Goa, if you don't mind us letting everybody know, because you did tell us earlier. Um, brilliant stuff. Okay, so from there, to get from a place where you might be overwhelmed to some or all of the above, if we go to the next slide, place of love from Giovanna, I think we are in a place of transformation, and I believe the timing is right for a new vehicle, and I, I call that inner wellness. I'd like to spend a few minutes to explain. Um, Sheila has just a place of love and certainty, which is important. We've got uh, sorry, some people are raising hands. If, if there's a question, please put it in the chat. We will definitely have a question uh, at session at the end without without uh, any doubt. Natalia, care and peace. Okay, so what do I mean by inner wellness? If we click uh, this point, uh, next point, I won't read it all. For me, over the journey I've taken, it's about all of the mind, body, and spirit. But the powerful thing is inner wellness is based on love as the most powerful force that builds leadership of ourselves, of individuals. Now, whenever I use that four-letter word, love, in the UK, people get a little bit uneasy. They think this is all a little bit woo-woo and a, a, a bit strange. And what I found interesting was where this actually came from, the provenance of this particular quote. If we click the next couple of points, uh, Rebecca, uh, you'll see it actually comes out of West Point, the US Military Academy, in its leadership program at the highest level, puts spirit uh, as its key element of leadership. If you click the next point, which I absolutely found astounding, there's evidence that military units in the field, when they have altruistic love, hope, and vision, and leaders exude that, that makes them more effective in the most challenging circumstances. But I find that quite interesting. So it may sound a bit woo-woo, but if you do see a US Marine and you want to say that their training is a little bit woo-woo, good, good luck with that um, conversation is all I'll say on that point. But that's important. Well, that, where I think we are at, is we're at a point of tremendous revolution. In psychology, the last 120 years has been really the study of pathology, what makes people deviant in the old language, what people, how people act in certain ways, how do they not conform. The last 25 years has seen a huge revolution in positive psychology, studying how people flourish. Multicultural psychology, bringing in evidence from around the world, we're not just having a Western model. It's a bit like the environmental movement. If you're as old as I am, um, the environmental movement a generation or two ago was reserved for people who were pretty much regarded as a bit in the margins, a bit strange and 
uh, happy clappy maybe. Today, the environment, COP28, even oil companies, as part of their brand equity, want to showcase how much they're committing to the environment. So it's a tr I think we're in the same revolution when it comes to psychology, the psychology of spirit, who we are as people. And the next slide hopefully will expand upon that just very briefly. Uh, if we go to that one, please, uh, Rebecca. Um, we can click both points, actually. Uh, these are individuals who I've um, worked with, whose, lead, whose work I draw upon. And Dr. Lisa Miller, a clinical psychologist, she's saying what ancient traditions for thousands of years have said, e even in despair and depression, there's a, a, a potential for awakening. Rupert Sheldrick has highlighted, is a very well-known botanist, and he worked really hard to show that the evidence now, science is investigating spiritual practices as never before. Bringing it together, what I'm talking about here is mind, body, and spirit. And what I mean by spirit, let me define this very carefully. It's that sense of meaning, connection, and purpose. It doesn't have to be religious, it can be, but that idea of us being a, a whole, a single whole to which we're connect, connected, and our own personal, we have a mental well-being. If we go to the next slide, Rebecca, we'll bring this all together. All of these things are really important. All of them contribute to who we are in terms of mind, body, and spirit. And that's what I want to talk about in the uh, second half of today and with some specific exercises. But that's what I mean by inner well-being. But I've been really um, delighted that people have been so open in sharing some of these challenges and some of the emotions that they're feeling. Just for a second as a segue, I think four, four years ago, Re Rebecca, mental health was still on the periphery in many ways. I think the, the, the uh, pandemic has allowed people to be more open and people to be more accepting about this. I've just been intrigued. I'm still finding, however, significant numbers of people in different industries still feeling reluctant to open up and share in their workplace in particular that they're not at their best. I'm a former lawyer. And in the legal profession, despite all the lovely uh, things on the wall which says have a safe place and open, I, I think there are many people, and I know that from personal experience, who actually don't feel comfortable enough to say that actually they're not 100%. I've just been intriguing. Does, does anyone here know people who still can't feel at ease and at peace to be able to share that they're not in a good place in the workplaces? Alex, someone that you might know uh, in broader uh, people that you know, I, I still think we've got a long way to go. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think um, I definitely think that there has been progress made, as you said, but um, I think it can feel like a taboo still. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but um, I guess maybe it comes with practice and it's not something that we're used to, to talking about. Yeah, I hope, and hopefully these exercises that we're doing here, healthcare, I think, has improved a lot if we look at the NHS, but the stats from the NHS are still quite disturbing. Um, a few months ago, I think it was May, 25% uh, of people who were off sick in the NHS were due, were, were due to poor mental health. Now, there's many structural reasons for that. Um, we've got Caroline saying lots of people that she knows who can't, I think it's called presentism. They have to be present at work rather than say they're not quite 100%. Um, Ade is talked about lots of people, you know, so many people from Peter, thank you for, for sharing that, Peter. So I, I think the reason for that, uh, I'm one of those who don't share how I feel at work, fear of being judged, this is Medellin. Yes, there is support, but there are consequences. And I, and I think that is still true. And I think that it's very courageous of you to share that. And I think we all have to play a part in hopefully changing that narrative. It's not going to happen overnight. The, it is honest, the, 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 absolutely. But I've, I've seen tremendous change. And I just was intrigued to see where we got to. I think the reason for many people not sharing is, if we click to the next slide, we have a disconnect between the outer world and the inner world. Here is a picture which I've just taken from social media. You know, if you look at social media, our lives should look something along these sort of lines. You know, we all have to be you know, look a certain way, have certain things, and these become the markers and criteria of well-being or success, however that's defined. And I think the reality, if you click to the next point, Rebecca, inside we could be literally feeling like this. And that's what happened when I um, was in that period I've told the story earlier um, my, I couldn't save my marriage um, we made the decision uh, to part and I was in a tremendously fearful place because outside to the world life looked pretty good inside I felt it fracturing and that's why I went on that journey and if you click to the next point we um, 
uh, I put it together in that book that we talked about. My haircut looked a bit different back then. Uh, but I was on the BBC and they were very kind uh, to invite me. It became a, a, a top three bestseller on, on the, um, the uh, Kindle, I must taste that. So I'm not retiring soon on the back of that. And uh, no one's yet approached uh, Brad Pitt to play the movie. But the, the book was a chance for me to share the principles, which hopefully I can put together now. And I over the last few years, the thousands of people I've done webinars for or one-to-one -one training, group training. Everyone's different and unique. But what I found, if they're going on that journey we talked about at the beginning, from where we might be to the things that we want, the principles are very similar. And I just want to summarize how I put this together before we talk about the specific steps that you can take uh, every day. If we go to the next slide, please, uh, Rebecca. I put this into a, what I call a wisdom model. And what it means are the same simple steps that people have to take. The first one is they need clarity. They need to know exactly where they stand in whatever the challenge might be. Then they need creativity. Einstein said that we can't solve a problem at the same level that it manifests. We have to use our intuition and our heart. The third step I've seen everyone that I uh, work with take is contrition. Now this sounds counterintuitive. What I mean by that is self-forgiveness. I think a lot of people that I've worked with are, we're all trying to climb a mountain metaphorically. And so many of us carry a bag, in, in, my, in my imagination, filled with regrets and self-admonishment. We need to empty that and be a bit kind to ourselves. Secondly, and from there, we have, then have the ability to have courage and look forward and move forward. Now, these four things are focusing on ourselves. That's the important thing that we bear in mind. But in order to have a fulfilling life, we have to look beyond ourselves and compassion. Now, the, the direct translation means rocks in the, in the rucks, Caroline, well put. Compassion means to suffer with in the literal translation. What I mean is to be able to support other people, to contribute that sense of connection and wellness that we talked about, meaning and purpose. And finally, we need consistency. Alex talked about New Year's resolutions and the beginning of a year, we can always make commitments how do we make it part of our DNA on a daily basis? Because that's the way that we're going to make change. So if we go to the next slide, today, I'm, the next section, I'm only going to talk about that first segment that I normally go through and only partially, because normally it's a much longer process, and that's around clarity. And that's the most important thing to begin that process. So if we go to the next slide, if there's a challenge that's facing you, you don't have to share it with somebody. Um, I'm looking, for example, to get um, fitter. I'm, I'm going back after 25 years to play cricket again, um, and uh, that will be interesting. Um, some other people that I'm at the moment coaching are facing a career challenge and they want to move to a different career. You have a think about if there's anything that you said, Alex, you may have set some goals for this year, whatever they may be. The process is exactly the same, which is what I encourage people to do. The first thing is to be, is to work out where you are with searing honesty. You don't have to make a big confession to people, but if you want to get fitter, where are you exactly? Until you face that truth properly, you might be in a relationship. I've coached many people who want to change a relationship. You have to be very honest about because we can lie to ourselves about many, many things. So where are you now? Secondly, you need to organize what assets do you have? However overwhelming the situation may be, um, I'm someone who's personally been uh, homeless twice, not on the street, but I was, I'd lost everything twice. Where were my assets? I had friends, I had in, in, uh, some information, knowledge, statistics, whatever you might have. We all have resources around us more than we realize. We need to list those things. Thirdly, we need to have a negation of those voices, that negativity, the uh, propensity to perhaps sometimes look on the pessimistic side. How do we do that? And then we need to make a decision. Are we going to change? What do we actually want to achieve? And have that set out clearly in our mind. Now that can all be done at the desk. The big thing is execution. We're gonna start getting fitter. It's gonna, it's gonna be mid January. It's raining, it's cold, it's six o'clock in the morning. Are we gonna actually execute what we're gonna do? It might just be a, a, a walk around the block to start with, rather than a seven mile, I want to do a marathon. Let, let's have that as a vision. And we didn't have to create a ritual around all of this. So let's dig into this now in this second half uh, of uh, the, the webinar. If we go to the next slide, please, Rebecca. What we're trying to negate and, and minimize, if we click on that, worry, 
anxiety, fear. We've had some of those words, they're synonyms. Here are two steps that have worked for people. As I said, I promised everything I'll share has worked. The first one is gratitude. Now, all the literature around positive thinking says that if we can find things to be gratitude, to be grateful for on a daily basis, it will make a profound difference to our sense of abundance. So big stuff, little stuff. What do I do? What do I mean by this? Three minutes, three minutes a day to give gratitude. I write them down. I write them down in a small book. I write all the things that I'm grateful for that if they weren't in my life would be profoundly painful. So this typically would be the people that we love, uh, home, our opportunities, our health. Secondly, for three minutes, I write down everyday things, anything that's happened in the previous 24 hours for which I'm grateful. Now, we may have had a miserable day. The traffic might have been terrible. The kids might have been playing. Our work might have been pressurized. But I write down 12 things for which I was grateful. You can start with three. I would recommend three things that we take for granted that have happened in the previous 24 hours. Anyone lost their, I, I, I lost the electricity in my house last year for five days. I now give, I walk around the house saying thank you out loud. So, you know, if you're working with me, I might be a strange person. But I'm grateful if the Amazon delivery is on time. I'm grateful if my daughter, you know, wants to give me a hug. Any simple little things that we sometimes take, I'm grateful that I got here on time, despite the fact that there's been train delays. If we look hard enough, there's enough to be grateful for. And for me, at the end of the week, I have 84 things that are written down. Does that mean it's going to solve all my problems? And No, but it's very hard to have two thoughts. Lack, which is what leads to fear, and abundance when you're grateful around you. Be interested to find out. Um, gas leak in November for 10 days. No, he, oh, wow. Okay, Rebecca, you definitely trump me on that. Be interesting. Does anyone have a, I mean, Americans have a, um, Thanksgiving as a specific time. Anyone here practice gratitude? at all just being intriguing alex rebecca is this something you've seen other people do it's something that i'm seeing a lot more of on a, on a regular basis it is it is something that uh, as you said at the beginning it's simple but it doesn't mean it's easy so it's one of those things i have done um but not in a consistent way uh, but i do know other people who do do journaling very consistently and they they speak very highly of it so i think for me this is something that personally i i would like to do on a much more consistent basis brilliant okay alex is that uh, something that you've done or tried or seen other people just i'm just intrigued to see if anyone has, has tried this i've tried i've bought you know um specific journals that give you the prompts and things and i'll do it for a few days and then i I just stop. Um, but I do really enjoy it when I'm doing it. And I think it's just getting the habit and the rhythm of, of doing it regularly, which I'm not quite not quite at yet. But yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to have 80 odd things that I'm grateful for at the end of each week. So that sounds good. And I'm sure I do. Well, I, no, no, well I, I, I'm just reading Caroline here. I have a jar that when good things happen, write them down and pop it in the jar and read them into me. And that's magic. That's a magical thing to do because you have that there when it, it's like a it's like a reservoir of wonderful things so brilliant. thank you for sharing that Caroline. what i'd recommend as i said to keep it simple and it really works i'm sold definitely great idea three minutes that's what we're suggesting three minutes to give gratitude for as i said the big stuff the people that you love your health whatever that might be that's important to you i give um, in that regard i i remember the faces in particular of people two in particular who are no longer here who played a big part in my life when i was a child and i remember them and their faces and it makes and i'm grateful for the things they may have said or, or, or helped me along the way and it just makes me feel sometimes people can feel lonely even in a crowd if you've ever been in a crowd and felt alone sometimes you need that connection to something that's eternal so i would definitely try prayer time we're, with god precious yeah we're going to come that's fabulous we're going to definitely come on to that issue in in, in, a, in the next slide but I think there again i'd imagine precious you're giving gratitude uh in those in those uh, uh moments there with uh, if, if people who, who are believers in a in a higher power and the everyday stuff i think alex you can get a journal i i just happen to put put them on on here because i just scribble them down when i get a chance best thing to do this is in the morning um to start your day or whenever your day starts if people are working shifts uh, whatever the day starts i always find it helpful to do it the day after because I, if you like 
me, your day starts with craziness, you might have a school run, you might have this, but your mind is working straight away and we need to just step back and, and, and do this. I think it makes uh, a big difference. I'll be, sit, I'll be able to catch up, Alex, if you try this between now and the next uh, webinar, see if any, uh, it's made any difference. Okay, uh, step two, we're trying to quieten that fear, that, uh, that worry, anxiety, visualization. So what do I mean by that? I was fortunate enough to take a course on guided imagery with Professor Brent Bauer. He's a professor of uh, medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, he, he calls it guided imagery, I'll call it visualization. And this is about looking ahead and visualizing, as it says, whether with words or pictures. I don't know everybody individually. Some people think in pictures, other people words. I like words. So where do you want to be? Something that's important to you. If you have a specific plan, what would you like? We've all achieved different things in our lives, overcome obstacles, and they would have been an idea at the beginning here. All the psychology now shows the peak performance. If you look particularly in sport, visualization is an everyday thing. Why can't we use it for our benefit? So uh, I, I've never watched a basketball game from beginning to end, but for whatever reason, a few years ago, I became very enamored on, on YouTube with the motivational um, language of a chap called Kobe Bryant. Uh, he was a magnificent uh, basketball player, apparently one of the best of all time. He died very tragically with his uh, uh, daughter in a helicopter accident. But what, what he said, and he's one of the greatest uh, of all time, he literally would say that every game that he would play on the court, he'd already played in his head. He'd already gone through all of the points that were going to come up that he expected, and he'd played the shot a hundred times in his head. If the top performers are doing this, why can't we have access to that? And what I mean by short term and long term, what I do, I visualize a year ahead in my personal relationship, family life, in my professional life, in my development, in my spiritual life. I, I, I say out loud what I, where I want to be. And I do five years. I do one and five years. That works for me. For others, it can be whatever period works for you. I um coached one-to-one -one, uh, some time back uh, an individual who she was a very celebrated leader in her field super successful in in the business environment someone i admired immensely but who unfortunately was in an abusive relationship physically abusive relationship they had two young children and when as she was transitioning from that she said look so hey, I, I can't visualize beyond next week and next month i've got just this is a chaos and i said fine Visualize next hour. Uh, this, this is not prescriptive. If that will work for you, let's do that. So yes. Oh, in, in the next week, in the next uh, week, I want to make sure I can find a flat. In the next month, I want to instruct lawyers. In the next, to, whatever works to get to the next stage that you have in your life, is really important. Why do this? Because it takes us out of the maelstrom of the everyday and the mundane. We have to do those things. But it might inspire and what i found if you do this ideas start popping in your head because you're orientating your mind to something so very very quickly i know people have do vision boards and some people make this into a really amazing i like to keep it really simple which i know is difficult for a former lawyer but i'm trying to keep it so it's three minutes a day i do this anyone done this or know other people who who've done it in terms of visualization. Um, Alex, Rebecca, I'm coming to you guys because I know that you've, uh, uh, you know, self-help and development is really good in terms of important to you, whether it's yoga or your own sporting background, Rebecca, music, musician background, anything that you've done that? Yeah, so I think the visualization is something that I do much more of on a regular, consistent basis rather than the gratitude, which is what I think I Will work on this year um but it's that yeah that that long and short-term visualization i think for me has been really a powerful tool um in my life to date uh it doesn't mean obviously it doesn't mean you can see into the future but i think you know that the, the whole concept of sort of manifestation manif manifesting where you want to be um has has been really powerful for me brilliant thank you for that so hopefully people can have a think about that uh I, caroline i think we all do to a varying degree, maybe not consciously. And that's a great point, Caroline. I was going to ask, um, anyone ever here worried about the future, whether it's their job or their kids or family? Anyone ever had any 
fearful worries about the future. Okay, of course, Belinda says, why are you asking such a stupid question, sir? Um, well, the reason I ask for that means that we're all brilliant at visualization, but we tend to visualize what we don't want. So many people think about what might go wrong, and that's important because we do need to plan and we have insurance and things like that. The key issue is look ahead and let's start thinking about what we do want. Three minutes each day. Okay, next slide, please. Just conscious of the time. Um, so we have to make a decision about our self-worth. You click on the next point, self, self-value, self-love. Do we love ourselves? Not in a narcissistic manner, but healthful. Because until we can get to that point or have a journey towards that, we're going to find challenges along the way. Sometimes we'll accept behaviors from other people that we shouldn't. So what can we do to inculcate more of this? Two, step, two um, steps, if you go to the next slide, please, Rebecca. Uh, first is forgiveness. So what, what do I mean by this? I'm here talking about forgiving ourselves, not forgiving other people who may have done things that have hurt us. That is a very important pathway, but very different, has different moving parts. Just want to make that very clear. This is self-forgiveness. Anyone ever have the voice in their head that reminds them of things that they should have done, things that they shouldn't have done? Anyone got family members that sometimes remind you of the failings? Two hands up here. Okay, so we get that, and that builds. That's that bag or the rocks in the rucksack we talked about earlier. So what can we do about that? Professor Everett Worthington in the US, clinical psychologist, has done a life's work on the effect of forgiveness, self-forgiveness, including self-forgiveness. What I did, and this is the one where I said to you, I was going to be truthful to you always, this is not going to be easy. So I got to a point in that transition period a few years ago when everything personally was falling apart, and I looked in the mirror and I realized that my voice was reminding me of so many things uh, and what I did in solitude and serenities, I spent and took me a long time. It took me months and I did it late at night on my own. I didn't have to go and do it in front of anybody. I went through everything where I had let myself down, where I had not fulfilled my promises, where I had um, uh, failed to do something or done something that was still haunting me. And I went through every incident. It was very hard, it was very emotional. It took a long time, but those voices hardly come back to haunt me today, virtually not. I allowed myself to face that, and eventually it, it cleansed myself of it. If you have those voices, this is not easy, but it's invaluable for me and for everyone that I've worked with, and I invite you to think about that. On a more everyday level, you ever had road rage? People sometimes been a bit short with colleagues or family. We're just under a lot of pressure. Take a bit of time on a daily basis just to forgive yourself. We're human. We need to be self kind to ourselves. And that journey, I think, for me was really important. I ended up uh, at one point, and I'm not encouraging for anyone to do this. Um, I ended up taking confession uh, with a Jesuit priest. Uh, I'm a Muslim by faith, so it was, you know we're not from the same background, but it was one of the most beautiful moments in my life. It was part of a spiritual journey, and I felt a wonderful connection. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately, he was a great scholar. So forgiveness, we need to empty that bag, make that journey up. The, you can do it without it. You don't have to do any of these things. I just think we need, we can flourish a lot more when we lighten our load. Contemplation, I want to go into this one. And what I mean by contemplation, what do I mean by this? I'm using it as a synonym for meditation and prayer. Depends on your background. You can call it whatever you want. What does it mean? Simple and immediate. Three minutes, three minutes to begin with. Breathing, being present in the moment, which is what all of those things do. And just observe your breathing. The goal is just to observe. Breathe, inhale, exhale, and you're an observer. The literature on the benefits of meditation is, is huge. Herbert Benson, famous cardiologist in Harvard, wrote a book called The Relaxation Response, I think 50 years ago, top of my memory, with all the benefits that this brings in terms of well-being and flourishing and all the biochemical reactions. Um, if you're religious, you can do this. Obviously, there's a, there's a prayer that you can do. 
Um, Sam Harris uh, wrote a book called Waking Up. He's a virulent atheist, so very, very anti-religious. He wrote a book called Waking Up Spirituality Without the Religion, and he meditates. Now, the medita meditation and contemplation has a thousands of years history, and particularly in the uh, Far Eastern traditions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism. It, that doesn't matter for now. The goal is three minutes, keeping it simple. Observe, start the day, connect to yourself with no judgment, no judgment whatsoever. Now, the key thing here, three things will happen. One, if you've never done this before, your inner voice will go into hyperdrive and tell you, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you should be doing this. Your job is to ignore. The second thing that will happen if your voice, inner voice was anything like mine, you will discover that much of what goes on as chatter in the head uh, is fantastical, is not based on reality. And actually, there are probably things that are being said by you to you that if you were to say them about someone else, you might get a slap in the face. That was my voice. Super critical. Those are, that's the second thing you'll notice. So much of it isn't, re isn't really real. Thirdly, they'll develop a distance between you and the voice. We sometimes conflate the voice as us. Just as you're listening to me, you listen to your voice and you realize that actually the voice is not you. It's a product of all the vicissitudes of life, good, bad and ugly you went through. And bringing that to practical, what it um, meant for me, it's politically incorrect to say this, but I grew up in what was then called a broken home, which was very unusual for my demographic. I remember very much being sent to my, by my father to the local butcher's shop to buy meat every week for the family. And at the end of the order, I would go to the counter and say the same sentence every day, every week, and say, my father will be along later to pay. I was of an age where I understood from the reaction of the proprietor that the reason why I had been sent is that we didn't have the money to pay. So that I carried a lot with me. I call that the boy in the butcher shop. I carried that self-image with me for years. I became a lawyer, whatever I became, it would haunt me all the time and I would fight it. I used to be an amateur box. I used to fight this demon in the head until I started doing contemplation and prayer and just looking at and accepting that actually that, that's not me. That's an aspect of my personality. There's a deeper, I believe there's a deeper part of us which is perennial and always brave and beautiful. And if you can access that, that's what allowed me to now say to that voice when heaven, he very rarely shows up now, but when he does, I don't fight, I embrace. And I say, I know you're trying to protect me. I'm not that Sahel anymore. And that helped me to make a huge distance from that which used to, which used to weigh me down a lot. Very briefly, because I'm just conscious of time, prayer, meditation, contemplation, anyone do it? This is mushroomed over the last couple of decades, so I don't know, Alex, I think yoga, these type of things, you're something very passionate about? Yeah, so I, I've been practicing yoga for about five years now, and I'm actually learning to be a, a yoga teacher at the moment on the weekends. Um, and so we've done a lot around pranayama, which is the uh, what what yogis call breathing techniques. Um, and it's taken me a really long time to get to a point where I can quieten those thoughts. I don't think they'll ever disappear entirely. Um, and I think it, for me, it's been about acknowledging that that's okay. Um, and I'm still value you from, from doing the techniques. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely. This is a big one for me. Um, defi definitely agree with what you're saying. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And Caroline's come, uh, there's an inhale for seven, hold for four, breathe out for seven. Fabulous. Every night before sleep, it focuses the mind. Brilliant. I, I recommend this in the mornings. It can be done anytime, of course, but in the morning, because for me, with all the noise goes crazy, I like to have those few minutes to connect, whether you want to call it prayer, meditation, uh, or, or contemplation. And you're right, Alex, at the end of the day, that have the voices completely gone? I'm not promising anyone who says here's five steps and everything solved you know if you can find nirvana and enlightenment please let me know because i will definitely come and listen to that because i haven't found that that's not the goal the goal is simply to be an observer and make that distance and connect to that deeper beautiful perennial self which i believe exists for in, in the center of every human being okay uh, conscious we've got q and a at the end so right so we have to make this a ritual why if we click to the next point it will develop self-confidence and that focus and vision. We need to make it something we can do every day in amongst 
very busy lives. I mean, I still remember when all of the great gadgets and handheld devices first appeared and they were, does anyone remember that promise that it was going to give us a huge amount of leisure time? I, mean, I remember that it was sold on that basis. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's actually happened. So I'm a big fan of doing all of these something. Peter, if we could get to go and do a retreat, I would do it tomorrow. Not everybody can do it. So these simple things to ritualize, hopefully will make some sense. So last two uh, steps, right, language and text. What do I mean by this? So what I mean by here, we need to transcend out of the ordinary and we need to find that time where we can truly be ourselves. And there I mean who we are, who Rebecca, who Alex, who Peter is, not with our titles, not with our responsibilities. I'm willing to bet, I don't know, there's going to be times that maybe, maybe Alex sings in the shower. I don't know. Maybe Peter dances when he's doing something. You don't have to answer that question. There's a CEO in uh, the NHS who says that they sing out loud when they do the hoovering, which is, if you knew who it was, it's just it's an amazing uh, visualization. I won't repeat it. There's a place where we are truly authentic. And often that can come when we're sitting with friends or whatever, but often it can come through access to the highest in human creativity. That's what I mean by texts. It could be sculpture, it could be painting, it could be film, literature. I love poetry, for example, it could be music. Anyone listen to, um, anyone seen a film more than once? Anyone seen a film or an excerpt of a film many, many times? Right. So I, um, A Star is Born, does that, anyone remember that with Lady Gaga? So I went to see that in the cinema four times. It's a very visceral film. It brought a lot of emotions out for me. The, the Greeks call it catharsis, you bring the emotions out. Only Fools and Horses, I'm of an age when I remember when that came out. I will still watch it today. My 14-year-old actually, for some reason, seems to love it. So I get to relive it. It makes me laugh. It makes me feel free. Music. Anyone listen to a music track over and over again? Play it on repeat. Why? Because we have a connection. Sometimes it can make us cry. Sometimes it can make us connect to the highest emotions. Now, my... Reputation as it may, whatever it may be, may be dashed, but I am an ABBA fan. I do not apologize for that. And I will listen to ABBA. I will listen just to get some a uh, bit more credit. Blinded by Your Grace by Stormzy, if anyone's ever listened to that. It's absolutely beautiful. So these things, three minutes a day, that's the goal. Find three minutes every day to be whoever you are without any of the masks. However, that may be. Could be just looking at nature. Well, anything that comes straight to you, I mean, Rebecca, I'm just going to come to you because I know you're a musician and you're a very creative individual, so it may be music for you, Alex, I'm not sure. What, what do people do to, to really just connect out of uh, and really connect to, to themselves? Forest bathing from Karaka, okay, that's very powerful. There you go, right with nature, amazing. Yeah, I think you're right with music. So absolutely playing some, depending on what mood I'm in, some pretty intense classical music. Uh, but also, like Alex was saying, some sort of cheesy ones to sing along to where you can be really be yourself. And I think it was already in the chat earlier, someone mentioned about cold water swimming. Uh, I yes. Think we've got some cold water swimming fans on the webinar today. So I would, I would certainly agree with that. I think it really gets you out of your comfort zone and it really gets you kind of viscerally in touch with yourself and nature so i'm a big fan of that absolutely fantasy by uh, mariah carey from alex okay great peter swimming uh, fabulous whatever that might be uh, music uh, medlin uh, my Lam is my favorite and uh, naomi ryan's song music reading from becky yeah so for me i do a mixture of that music or film uh, but I do a lot of reading. Um, I love uh, spiritual works and poetry uh, in, in particular, which is, I think, really uh, quite powerful for me. OK, so bringing this all together. Uh, Ade, thank you for your comment. I appreciate that. I'd love to know what music you listen to. If you want to share it, you don't have to, or film um, that uh, touches you. Daily success ritual. This is about being it's personal to you, and it should be the primary thing you do. As I say, at the beginning of your day, there could be a shift that could be the middle of the night. It depends on the work patterns you have. But I would recommend the beginning of the day. And it's five things that we've talked about, three minutes each. We're going to contemplate for three minutes. We're going to give gratitude for the big stuff for three minutes. We're going to visualize for three minutes. We're going to give gratitude for the previous 24 hours. Start with three things. And then finally, for three minutes, we're going to 
you know, listen, read, listen to music, forest bathing if it's if it's uh, 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 possible. Those fifty, if I could put a gun to your head, uh, metaphorically speaking, this will be what I would recommend people to do, and this would make the biggest difference because it's fifteen minutes. I tend to spend up to forty-five minutes doing this on a regular basis. I've just got up earlier. It sets my day. I feel connected. It's something that actually allows me to, in a sense, almost be, it's a rebirth of the day for me. And it took time. Uh, it was not easy, uh, but it's made a big difference. So if, if you can start with one of the, of the practices, I would recommend it. If you can get to all five, it will make a profound difference if you make it part of your daily routine. If we go to the uh, final slide, I think where we're trying to get to is I think the world is full of plastic people and is crying out for authenticity. And wherever you are, if you can be there fully, you as that individual, that unique refraction of what I believe is one light that connects us all, that gives us that sense of fulfillment and connection and, and self-acceptance and kindness. These steps have helped me to do that through tremendous uncertainty. They've helped many other people uh, around the world, including in the NHS and social care. I hope that some of these will add some value uh, to each of you who've uh, been good enough to share your time today. I think Alex and Rebecca, um, happy to answer any questions that people may have, um, but I think we've done well uh, for the time. And I think we have got some links because uh, if you want to practice some of these uh, steps, uh, we do have um, material that you can actually use between now and the next webinar uh, to, to go into a bit of a deeper dive on some of these uh, uh, steps one very quick hint if you're going to attend to contemplation you've never done it before please get out of bed and do it i know someone who tried to do it um and obviously went straight back to sleep once you sort of shut your eyes and start breathing so hopefully that will be of, uh, of value but thank you very much indeed